morning, guys. Happy Sunday. You guys doing all right? All right. Well, I'm excited to, to, to be here with you guys today. Always an honor to, to be able to speak and, and always exciting to kick off a, a new series of something that we think is important enough to spend three to, to five weeks on it. And so we're kicking off a series, as Joel said, called Hurry Up and Rest today. And, uh, you know, I want to be upfront about what we're going to do in this series. You know, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to challenge this church to really examine the, the rhythms of your life and to figure out if the rhythms of your life right now are as they should be. You know, uh, the, the point of a Sunday morning is never for people to come in here and to hear a message and to say, oh, I thought that was good or I thought that was bad. The point of everything we do, including the message and the worship and the prayer and the scripture, is we believe that the word of God and the truth of God is transformative. And so we want this stuff to get a hold of our lives and to transform our lives and to be instilled into our lives as practice. And so we're gonna look at the spiritual discipline of rest over the next three weeks. And we're gonna talk about how foundational it is in our lives, how foundational it is uh, in our walk with God. And if we want to have a flourishing, deep relationship with God, that there's some kind of rhythms of rest that we have to have in our life. And I think that this is an appropriate time for us to really examine the rhythms of our life because, first of all, we're going into the summer, and so uh, rhythms change when you move into the summer a little bit. And then, second of all, we're coming off um, like, you know, a, a year of, of, a, of a pandemic. You guys heard of this? It's called the coronavirus, and it sort of changed every, everybody's life for a year. And so this is a really good time now as we move back into the, the, you know, the, the world as we think it should be, as we trend back towards normalcy, to really look at your life and think about if what you're doing right now is, is how you want to live. You know, it's kind of like a chance to, to restart, a chance for, for a fresh start. And so it's a really good time for us to, to look at this stuff. One of the things that I decided I was going to do once we started to trend towards normal again is I decided I was gonna have to try to care about working out and being physically healthy again because the pandemic hit and I was just kinda like, well, that, I guess that means I don't have to work out anymore. <laughs> and Jenna was like, you can go outside. And I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> There's like a pandemic out there. It was like a convenient excuse to like just not do anything for a year. And I kinda have a, a complicated relationship and history with exercise because I played sports my whole life and when you play sports, you have people there that make you do stuff. And so you have coaches and they make you do stuff and this all culminated with playing college baseball where I had like a whole team of people who were paid to make me work out. So I had like trainers and strength coaches and position coaches and head coaches and nutritionists and they were all like making sure that I was doing certain things in order for you to be in some kind of physical condition where you can actually perform the way that, that you're supposed to. And then you graduate from that and you leave that world and it's like you find yourself in the wilderness by yourself and you're like, now I have to figure out how to like motivate myself to go to the gym. And for 10 years, with varying degrees of success, this has been where I've been, trying to motivate myself to go work out. And, and you know, the pandemic was a good excuse to just kind of be like, I guess I don't have to worry about that part of my life anymore. So I really wanted to kickstart this and I wanted to, to jumpstart it. And so for the first time in my life, I decided I would join a gym where they did classes. So it's like, you know, there's an instructor, which is kind of like a coach. And then there's other people that you're doing the same workout with. So there's like camaraderie and like teamwork. But then there's also competition that kind of pushes you to, to, to go harder. And I was like, that's a great opportunity for me to do this. And so I joined a gym in Grandview called System of Strength. And it's like this really high intensity workout. It is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And I, it's embarrassing because everybody at the gym looks like an Instagram fitness model. And they're really good at the workout. Like they don't even have to like stop in the middle of it. And I am really bad at this workout. And so like I show up and like you get through kind of the warm up part of it and I'm already kind of like hands on my knees, like you know, over my head walking around. And these other people like they don't ever stop. They can just do the whole thing and they definitely sweat because it's really hard, but they kind of glisten. <laughs> and I look like I jumped into a pool and like the workout mat that I'm working out on looks like I jumped into a pool. And I have to bring a beach towel with me so that I can put it on my car seat because if I forget it, I will literally ruin my car seat. 
by how much sweat I have. So this is like a three to four times a week I'm going to this place and I'm just getting embarrassed by all of these people there. And so I'm very competitive. And one of the things that I actually don't like about myself is I really don't like to look stupid. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna figure this thing out and I'm gonna get really good at this workout. And the only story I've ever really been told is that the way that you are to get to that point of flourishing like I wanna get to in that area is you have to push yourself more. And so you gotta take on more. And so you gotta go to the class more often, more consistently, you gotta do more reps, you gotta do more weight, you gotta keep going. And, and I started to feel these signs and warnings of exhaustion. You know, like not just muscle soreness, but I had some pain in my knee, which is a high school injury that started to come back. Some shoulder pain started to creep up, which is from college. And then for the first time in my life, I started to have some significant lower back pain. <laughs> and uh, you know, I was like, oh, I'll, I'll just push through it. I mean, I'm just gonna like put my nose to the grindstone, like I'm hurt, kind of, I'm tired. I feel like I'm maybe being stretched too thin physically, but I'm just gonna push through this because on the other side of this is the flourishing that I'm looking for, which in this context was simply to just not be embarrassed four times a week in front of all these people. But I was like, I gotta push through this, and I will push through this. And so I was doing more of it, more, 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 and then two weeks ago, in the middle of class, I threw my back out. So I am now injured. And it's kind of a funny story about what I thought was gonna happen and what actually happened. What I thought is the story that I've been taught, which is the way that you get to where you wanna go, the way that you transcend into that kind of flourishing area is you gotta take more on. And I know you're exhausted, and I know you're tired, and I know you feel stretched too thin, but you gotta go harder, more, because on the other side of that is the promise that we have, that promise of flourishing. And so I just thought, not only will I push through this, but once I push through it, the other side is what I want. And instead of pushing through it, I broke. Quite literally, my body like broke down. And now I'm resting not by choice. And now I'm recovering not by choice. This is an emergency now that I am physically responding to. And all of the other areas of your life that, that find collateral damage when you get physically injured are now things that I'm also dealing with. And as Joel was mentioning earlier, you know, one of the greatest privileges we have is we actually get to sit down and like get to know the people of this church. And so like I know your lives. Like I have a window into your life. Uh, you tell me your stories and you tell me about your weeks and you tell me about it. And that's very hard to argue that this is not a church full of people who are stretched really, really thin, whose lives are full and busy, whose margins have diminished, whose activities are wall to wall from, from Sunday all the way through the next Sunday, every day. And uh, the reason that we do this to ourselves is because we believe the same story. You know, that, that the only way that you're gonna get to where you wanna get is you have to add more. And we have these warning signs of exhaustion in our lives. You know, we have these areas of our life where we feel this deep tiredness, where we feel this distraction, this lack of focus, this inability after our work day or after we put our kids to bed to do anything with any kind of focus. And we feel that. And yet our response to that is never really to sit down with our spouse or our family or our friends and look at our calendars and try to figure out what we can get rid of in order to open up margin. Instead, because we believe this story so strongly, what we tend to do is we tend to, in the midst of our exhaustion, sit down with those people, open up our calendars, and see if there's any margin left so we can fill it with more activities. And what I wanna put forward today is that this is really, really dangerous game to play. You know, we're really sure that we can push through. We're really sure that we can add more and that we can persevere, that we can grind through it, and on the other side is flourishing. But what if we don't? What if we don't push through? What if instead of pushing through and finding this promised land that we think is on the other side of this more, what if instead we break? And then what other areas of our life are gonna be impacted by that kind of breakdown? And I'm not being dramatic. You know, this is a buzzword called, called burnout. And there's all kinds of books about it. There's all kinds of blogs about it. Uh, a lot of people that have gone and been successful in the leadership business area are people that suffered burnout and they're trying to help people not go there. It happens all the time. 
People burn out all the time. And as Christians, we should be particularly attuned to this kind of, of exhaustion, to this kind of breakdown. Uh, Henry Nouwen, who was a Christian intellectual in the 20th century, he says that burnout is secular shorthand for spiritual death. And there's people in this room today that feel that. You know, we feel that spiritual death. And maybe we don't yet feel like we're spiritually dead, but we feel like we're spiritually dying. We feel like our relationship with God is withering away before our eyes. You know, we want to pray and we want to be in communion with God, but we're not praying. And we're not in communion with God. And we want to open the scriptures and we want to be in the word, but we're not opening the scriptures. And we're not in the word. And we want to be in Christian community, but we're not going to a small group. We're only coming to church a couple times a month. We want our kids to have this foundation of, of Christian story in their life, but we're not really bringing them around to church very often. And our reaction to, to that kind of honest analysis of our spiritual life oftentimes is to look at ourselves with some kind of shame and self-condemnation, to say, you know, maybe I'm just not really a good Christian, or maybe I'm not a good person, or maybe I just don't have what it takes to follow God in this world. And the word of, of life and, and freedom that I wanna speak into this community today is maybe it's not that you're a bad Christian and maybe it's not that you're a bad person and maybe it's not that you just don't um, have what it takes to follow God. Maybe it is as simple as the fact that your life is not currently set up to realistically dwell deeply with God. Maybe you just don't have the margin in your life to, to follow God with any sort of depth and intensity. And the reason that that's hopeful is because that means that there is a, a practice that we can have, that we can put into our life that has the ability to unlock our, our ability to dwell deeply with God. That with rest as a foundational discipline in our life, we actually will have the ability to turn the key, to open the door, and to go into a world where we can dwell richly with the God who created us. That perhaps uh, the, the discipline of adding uh, effective rhythms of rest to your life is the discipline that unlocks our ability to do all of the other disciplines. You know, you think about your life right now. You think about your exhaustion. And it's like adding half an hour to pray every day is unrealistic. Adding half an hour to read your scriptures every day is unrealistic. Coming to church every Sunday is unrealistic. Doing that and going to a small group during the week at some time is, is unrealistic. And maybe it's because you have no time. But more likely, it's because even the time you have, you are emotionally frayed. And you, you cannot have that kind of focus. To imagine doing something like that with any sort of intentionality after the schedules that we put in front of us every day can, can sometimes feel laughable. The only thing we could possibly do is numb ourselves with Netflix or um, Bravo reality television for myself. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that this is, these, these are the lives that we've chosen, you know? And over the next few weeks, we're gonna talk about some real practical ways that we can add these kinds of rhythms of rest into our life. But the thing that I wanna do today is I wanna unpack the, the idea and the truth, in my opinion, that this isn't something we get to choose. This isn't a choice. It's not an optional thing. To have rhythms of rest in your life is not a nice to have. It's certainly not a privilege. It is something that is so deeply woven into the, the fabric of our creation that we have to have it in order to be fully human. You know, it's, 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 it's an emergency. This is not something to wait for a season to pass. This is something that we have to look at with the intensity that we should look at it based on the scriptures. And so I wanna open the scriptures today and I wanna show us just how deeply woven this is into who we are. And so we open the, the, the scriptures to the end of Genesis chapter one, which is the end of the creation story, which is the most beautiful story in, in, in the Old Testament, in my opinion. What God has done throughout the six days in Genesis one is he has taken a world that's dark and chaotic and disordered where life cannot flourish and he has pulled order and beauty and goodness out of it and he's filled it with life. It is now a flourishing world. 
uh, the world as God intends. You know, in the book of Job, uh, Job challenges the way that God is running the universe. And he's like kind of telling God that he's not just and he's not fair and he's not running the world the way that he ought to run it. And so God actually shows up and drops Job to his knees. And God starts asking him, you know, were, were, you, were, were you there? Were you there when I created all this? Like, you see all this? Were, were you around when I set the foundations of this world? Were you here when I stretched the ocean from this horizon to this horizon? And in one of the lines, he says, were you there when the stars sang together and the, the angels shouted for joy? Like, that's the kind of creation that we have. It's that beautiful. It's that majestic. It's, it's so devastatingly beautiful that we try the best we can with art and poetry and music to get at the heart of the beauty of this world, and we only scratch the surface. And on the sixth day, he creates humans, and it takes the world from good to very good. And the human beings are his images. They're made in his likeness. You and I, we are the closest things to God that any of us will ever experience until we meet God himself. That's how elevated we are in terms of biblical anthropology, what it means to be a human. And we are told to rule the world on God's behalf. He's the king. We are his delegated authorities. We're supposed to take this world and transform it into something better, more order, more beauty, more goodness. And we're given that task. And you think about those six days, all of that beauty, all of that amazing creation, that, that the source of all creative power, the God, the creator and sustainer of the universe, that after all of that beautiful creation, we still, after six days, have not yet reached the climax of the story. The climactic moment of creation has not yet come. It is not the creation of human beings that's the climax of that story. It is where we're going to pick up right now in Genesis 131. This is after God has created all of that. It says... And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. And thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. And so on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And then God blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. The climactic moment of the creation story is when creation is complete and God rests. The word rest here is a Hebrew word, Shabbat, which you and I translate as Sabbath. It means to stop. And so the climactic moment of creation is when God does his work and then he rests. He stops. He Sabbaths. And creation is not complete and whole. And there is no shalom until God rests. Until he stops. And remember, this is the God that we worship. We are images of this God, and so we are made in his likeness. And this is a God whose rhythms include rest. And so what do you think our lives are supposed to look like? You know, we're supposed to work, and we're supposed to produce. I mean, that's the task of being a human. Take this world and transform it with your, with your power, with your creativity, with your image of godness, and make it even better. And yet... Within this task, there are these rhythms of rest that are woven into the fabric of who we are and what kind of world we have. And so we don't really have a choice whether or not we rest. This is who we are. This is the world we've been given. You know, to claim to be uh, part of a creation, sometimes we take that for granted. We believe that this is a created order. You know, but what that means, the implications of that uh, are massive. It means that there's a way that this world is. It's not random. There's a grain along which creation operates, and as volitional beings with will, we have the ability to live along the grain of the created order, as we were created to do. And in so doing, we have a very good chance of flourishing, and yet we also have the ability to live against the grain of the way that the world was created, and in so doing, we have a very good chance of destruction or deterioration and living as less than we ought to be. And so this is true of lots of things of the world. But according to the biblical story, it may not be more true of anything than it is of this idea of rhythmically resting and recovering and restoring ourselves. This seems to be the kind of God we worship, and it seems to be the kind of world we created. We don't have that much detail about what the world was like prior to the fall. 
ever thought about that? After the fall, everything is compromised. Even the things we think are good, we have to look at and be like, I don't know. Sin is far-reaching. And yet one of the things that the world is like before the fall is that there's rhythms of rest and restoration. The Sabbath is a pre-fall condition of creation. Now what ends up happening is that the people of God, you know, Adam and Eve in the garden, they eat the fruit and they eat from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what that is, is that's a moment where instead of allowing God to be the king, the one who defines how the world ought to be, they decide that they will become self-determined beings, that they will decide good and evil. And that's why Christians call this rebellion, because we put ourselves in the place of God. He's on the throne. We say, actually, we'll take the throne and we'll take it from here. And there's lots of, of bad effects, detrimental effects to us that happen because of the fall. But the rest of the story of the Bible, really, from Genesis chapter 3 all the way through the end, is the story of how God is going to redeem his creation to how it was always supposed to be. It's a, it's a, it's a retelling. It's a recapitulation. It's a, it's a going back to the way things ought to be. And the way that God chooses to do this is he chooses a man named Abraham, and he says, you know, I'm going to go through you, and your family is going to become the people who represent me. People are going to look at them, they're going to see me, and people are going to be so compelled by what they see that they're going to come and want to be a part of it. Through you, the nations will be blessed. And so God's rescue plan is through the nation of Israel. That's what all of the Old Testament is about that leads to Jesus. And at the end of the book of Genesis, the people of God, the ones who are supposed to look like his proper images, they find themselves in Egypt, and they're flourishing. Now they're, they're being fruitful, they're multiplying, they're filling the land, just like the command to Adam and Eve. And uh, a, a new king, a new pharaoh comes along. And he sees this flourishing, and he feels threatened by it. And so he enslaves these people. And so the people of God become slaves of pharaoh. And to become a slave is to be dehumanized in probably the most explicit way that we know how to dehumanize people. Right? In, instead of being... Uh, like an image of God subject, you are an object. You're, you're a means to an end. You are there to produce. And so you use up a slave like you use up a machine. And when they can no longer work, you discard them and you bring in another one. It's like objectification to a degree that you and I probably can't even find imaginable in our world today. And so the people of God are in this condition. They're supposed to be his images, they're supposed to be the ones who reflect his glory to the world, the ones through whom the mission of God runs, and they're in slavery like this. They're that dehumanized. You know, they're, they're, they're that demeaned in this moment. And so God hears their cry, and he's faithful to his promises. And after 400 years of slavery, he delivers them into freedom. He parts the Red Sea, and they walk through on dry land to the other side into freedom. And so you think about what the purpose of Israel is. You know, it's, it's to reflect God to the world in the way that they are. And they've just been in slavery for 400 years. And so the first thing that God's going to do is he's going to restore their true humanity. So whatever it is that he does, the purpose of what he's doing is to remind them of who they are. You are a human being, image of God. You are my people. I choose you. And so they get into the wilderness and they immediately get hungry. And they immediately start to wish that they were back in Egypt because although they were slaves, they had food. And God is not going to allow his people to become slaves again. And so he provides for them. We just sang that song, Jehovah Jireh, God provides. God provides manna, it falls from heaven. This flat bread that tastes like coriander seed and honey, the, the Bible says. And so it falls from heaven, they've never seen it before. And it's not just there for them to have however they want. God gives them instructions. The first thing he does is provide bread and give them instructions. And he says that every single day, you will collect one day's worth of bread. If you try to collect more, it's going to rot and it's going to smell and it's going to go bad. And so collect one day every day for five days. But on the sixth day, you collect two days worth because on the seventh day, you Sabbath, you rest. And so in Exodus 16, 22... It says, on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person, and the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. And he said to them, 
This is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. And so they saved it until morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink, and it did not get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. For six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. So what's the first thing that God does to his people when he wants to restore their full humanity? He gives them the Sabbath back. Is that interesting? All the things you could imagine that you would do if you were God to restore the fullness of life to the people who have been slaves. And the first thing he does is he goes back to the way that the world was supposed to be, the created order, what's woven into our humanity, and the very thing that they lack for 400 years. You know, slaves don't get Sabbath. That's not the purpose of them in that context. Now they're free. How do they know it? Now they're supposed to be fully human. How do they do that? First thing God tells them, institute the Sabbath back into your life. Rhythms of rest restore our humanity. In order for us to be fully human, according to the biblical story, the way that we are supposed to be, our lives have to reflect the created order in some way. And this is a created order that has rhythms of rest in its foundation. That's the climactic moment of the creation story. Slaves for 400 years, no rest, no Sabbath, no rhythms. You're free. First thing, remember the Sabbath. Reinstill the Sabbath back into your practice, back into your life, because I am God. And I want you to be free. And I want you to be who you were created to be, fully human, full images of God. And for God, that begins with the Sabbath. The slaves become free when they reinstitute the Sabbath into their life. It's the first sign of freedom. It's the first sign of full humanity, of being the people that God has called us to be, the Sabbath. Rhythms of rest and restoration not really something that we can run away from if we claim that this story is our story. Not all of us claim that. I understand that. But if you're a Christian, you don't just claim to believe in a God that is abstracted from the Bible. You claim to believe that you are a participant in the continuation of this story, that this is the kind of world you live in, and this is the kind of God we worship, and these are the kind of lives that he has for us if only we'll choose life. You know, throughout the the conversation between Israel and God, when God gives them commandments, he tells them the commands and then he asks them to choose life. Follow this commands and choose life because God cares about us. He wants his people to be free. He wants his people to be fully human, to be real images of God. And so the command to Sabbath is not an inconvenience that God is putting into our life, another thing that we have to figure out. It is a key that supposedly unlocks the ability for us to be fully human, to be the, the beings that we were created to be images of God, majestic creatures who are supposed to rule on God's behalf over this world. As a, one of the interesting things to pull out of this, this scripture is that the Sabbath isn't something that just falls into their laps. You know, it's kind of like, like our world today, that this has to be an intentional practice. God says that on the sixth day, you have to collect two days worth of bread. In order to Sabbath on the seventh day, you have to prepare for the Sabbath, which means it has to be intentional. It's a practice. It's a discipline, you know, and that, that's the same thing is true for us. We're going to have to discipline this into our lives. This is going to have to become a habit, a practice uh, that we put into our life. Like any other discipline, you know, like if you've ever tried to read the Bible, like a reading plan, you read the Bible in a year or something, if you don't set up a routine that becomes a part of your daily discipline, you're not going to do it. Like I don't know how many times I've started to read the whole Bible and then I stopped. You're just going to get off track. You have to habituate it into your life. This is no different. This kind of rest is not going to fall into your lap, and the world is not going to make this easy on us. This has to be something that we see as a means towards freedom and transformation and discipleship and therefore intentionally put into our life. You know, the last thing that I just want to warn us about is, um, you know, the reason that the Israelites couldn't Sabbath for 400 years is because they were slaves. 
You know, so they couldn't do it. It wasn't available to them. And I just want to make sure that we understand that if you're in this room today and you think to yourself, you know, there's no way that I can ever institute those kinds of rhythms of rest into my life, you know, one of the warnings that we should look into is whether or not we're enslaved to something else, whether we're in bondage. Now, that was a reason that the Israelites couldn't do it and why God instituted it back into their life was to habituate into them that they were no longer like that. You know, but they can choose that. We, uh, when they got out into the wilderness, they wanted to choose to go back to slavery. Because for them, at the moment, to flourish was to find food. And their story was that there's food over there. So choose. You can choose to go back into slavery. You can choose to be in bondage to things. You know, and part of what God has for us is he wants us to break those chains. And he wants us to choose life. And he wants us to choose freedom. And he wants us to choose to be who we were really created to be. And so for the next three weeks, man, this is going to be a challenge. We're going to challenge this church and this community, and we're going to give options. You know, we don't necessarily believe that, that you have to take the seventh day and keep it holy. You know, one of the confusions is that Jesus had some significant controversies with the, the Pharisees and Sabbath, and the Sabbath was a command under the old covenant. And so now that we have life in Christ, we are part of a new covenant. And so people often ask, is it required for me to Sabbath? And it's an interesting way to phrase that question. Is it necessary? It's like, well, not necessarily in terms of new covenant relationship. You have to Sabbath. It's not like a new covenant commandment. But it is part of the created order. And so do you have to Sabbath? Do you have to have rhythms of rest in your life? I think the answer to that question is yes. You have to. You can't run away from your creation. You can't run away from who we are. The, the, the level of depth that that runs. And so we have to figure this out. You know, um, when we talk about generosity, we talk about the fact that the biblical picture seems to be this idea of a tithe, which is 10%. And so that is what we teach. You know, we want people to have these practices in their life of generosity, where as soon as money comes in, without even thinking about it, 10% goes out, because that forms you as a person into into. Uh, gener generous uh, characteristics like God has. But we understand that's a kind of a long road for people to get to sometimes. And so our advice is that you start somewhere. Just start at 10%, start somewhere. The same is true of, of Sabbath rest. It would be great if you had a life where you have habituated into it that on the seventh day, every day, uh, every seventh day, you just like rest. But we know that it's a long road to get to, and so start somewhere. Maybe it's a Friday night. Friday evening after work, and maybe order dinner in, and you drink wine, and you turn the TV off, and you turn your phones off, and you commune with the people that you love. Or maybe it's Saturday morning, you wake up, and it's peaceful, and you can go for a walk, and you can go to get coffee, and you can intentionally have conversations with the people you love. Maybe you start there. Start somewhere. The one thing that we cannot do is have lives with no margin, lives with no rest, lives where we're acting as if we're enslaved to something that is not allowing us to be who we were really created to be in God's original created order. And so for the next three or for the next two weeks after this, we're gonna we're gonna dive into it. And I want to challenge you guys to uh, to do that. I will tell you that this is not something that I have like figured out personally. Um, when I came into ministry, my weekend is Friday, Saturday. And my wife works in corporate retail, and so her weekend is Saturday, Sunday. So we have one day together, basically all week. And so we decided that we were going to try to keep Saturday holy and keep it, like, just between us and allow us to rest and be together. And we've done, like, a pretty decent job over the years. Like, it's not perfect, and we don't always keep it. But it was interesting because just two weeks ago, I already knew that I was doing this message. And because I injured my back, as you guys now know, I scheduled a yoga class on Saturday morning because I wanted to try to, like, you know, work on my back, like, stretch it out or whatever. I don't really know how yoga works, but uh, I, I scheduled it. <laughs> and I woke up my wife because I still wanted to go get coffee. So I woke Jenna up at, like, 8 o'clock. I was like, I got a class later. Let's go. And she was, like, kind of, like, irritated with me as we were walking. And finally, I was like, what, what, what's going on? And she was like, you scheduled a class today. 
And I was like, I know, it's, uh, my back hurts. And she was like, it's Saturday morning, this is our Sabbath. And I was like, I am preaching about that in a couple weeks, so I can't really, <laughs> I can't really argue with you. My bad. Um, but it, may, it actually made me feel good that apparently, even maybe like without calling it that, we had some kind of rhythm in our life that we can build upon to, to Sabbath or to rest more effectively. You know, at the end of the day, to Sabbath is an act of faith, an act of faith that, that no matter how much it seems to go against the grain of the stories that we're told and the salvation schema that we're given by the world, that it is something that God has for us. And so we trust him in that. You know, we trust him that our jobs are going to be okay. And we trust him that our families are going to be okay if we rest. And we trust him that if we rest, there is a deeper depth that we can dwell with him. And so we move into that faith in a series like this. And we start to institute and habituate these kinds of practices into our life. And in so doing, the promise from God is that in that faithfulness, we become more fully human which is probably nothing that any of us should desire more for our time on this earth. Amen? All right, let's pray. God, thank you for this day and thank you for this community. I just pray that um, you allow us to see the, the, the world that you have for us and the lives that you have for us and the ways in which the rhythms of creation can be reflected into our life. And I just pray that you give us the capacity and the obedience to trust you in that, to trust you that with rest comes life, to trust you that, that with those rhythms we can actually live a fuller life, that we can flourish even more than uh, we, could, we could possibly imagine. I just pray that as a community we find revival in this, that we actually move into it, and over the next three weeks as we unpack some of the practical ways that this can look in our lives, in our context, and in our situations, um, that not only is the necessity of it felt by us, but as we start to institute those practices, the life that you have for us and the fullness that we can feel it right away and that we can start to live into it, God. Um, we wanna trust you and we wanna believe in you and we wanna believe that you have our deepest desires and our deepest happiness and concern and you tell us how to live. And I just pray that uh, through rest and through these practices, that we can become more and more fully human, transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ every day. It's in your name we pray, amen. All right, we'll see you guys next week and then for the next two weeks for the rest of this series, all right?